So a couple of things to touch on really quickly. First, if you didn't watch the last retro review, which was ECW One Night Stand 2005, you probably should check it out. I'll put the link to the entire retro review series in the description box below, and you probably should check out all of them. Just saying. Number two, remember to make your suggestions for what you'd like to see me tackle next in this retro review series in the comments to this video. And it could be pay-per-views, it could be Raws, Nitros, Smackdowns, Thunders, it could be DVD sets, it could be TV shows, it could be movies, any of those things. Anything is possible as long as it's wrestling related for this wrestling review series. And also, remember I laid down the challenge already on this channel that if 15 of you, by the end of September 30th, 2017, buy the Assume Jeff Jarrett position shirt from the OTRS Central Store at Pro Wrestling Tees, it's got front and back image and graphics, I will buy the four disc DVD set that TNA put out years ago about Jeff Jarrett. I will watch all four discs, which I believe is about 16 hours of content. And then I will have to come on here and do a review about it. So if you want that to happen, you know what you got to do. It only takes 15 of you to make magic happen. Well, magic for you and not for me. Anyways, let's move on to the topic of at hand for this video, which is ECW One Night Stand 2006, which happened in large part because of the rousing success that ECW One Night Stand 2005 was. On top of that, the WWE was getting ready to launch uh, the revitalized, revamped ECW, or as we call it now, the WWE CW brand. So it made sense that One Night Stand happened again in 2006. And the show itself was a decent success from a pay-per-view standpoint. It did about 280,000 buys, which was about, I think, 45,000 fewer than the previous years. But again, still a pretty good, pretty strong number, uh, even at that time, uh, putting it on par with the Survivor Series in terms of pay-per-view buys. So when you look at it, even though you had to know deep down inside that Vince was going to bastardize the hell out of ECW and ruin it and put the final nail in the coffin of it, it made sense from a business standpoint to say it had been several years. You own the rights to ECW. There is clearly still a market there for the name, the likenesses, uh, the images associated with it. So why not try to draw in some of those fans and fool them into thinking, hey, this isn't WWE, this is ECW, let me support the brand, especially if you put a figurehead like Paul Heyman in charge of it and overseeing it. It, it made a lot of sense. And I will say this, for 2006's version of One Night Stand, even though I'm probably in the minority here, I actually liked it more than I liked 2005. A lot less promo, even though, honestly... The promos were some of the best part of the first One Night Stand show. I think in part that was some of the problem because so much of the focus was on the WWE guys being there from Raw and SmackDown and so many different promos being cut by Heyman, by freaking RVD. Again, the promo work was great, but honestly, the promo work was the best part of the show and not exactly what you want to buy a pay-per-view for is great promo work. That great promo work should come on Raw and SmackDown, not on the pay-per-view. You had much less promo time here, and I thought it really helped the show. Like, even Paul Heyman coming out for the opening promo. You get the crowd into it right away. It was short. It was sweet. It was to the point. Kind of a nostalgia trip. And then you move the hell on. Perfect. Your first match was Taz versus Jerry Lawler. And I got to say, you could see the real genius of the heel Jerry Lawler don't have to do very much and you make it count you know the audience you're stepping into you know the environment you're going to be in so if you don't have to do a bunch of shit why do it you know going over there and smacking joey styles and kind of sauntering down to the ring with a smile was all jerry lawler had to do take absolutely zero bumps and get the damn job done and to me in cases like this it's always better for the heel to lose quickly and in this particular case as well, I felt like it was better for Taz to win quickly. 
You know, if the crowd is so hot, why not take out Jerry Lawler immediately? You could have went five to seven forgettable minutes, but you didn't. Go home in freaking 35 seconds, which is pretty much exactly what they did here. Taz immediately locks him up in the Taz mission, and that is it. It's over. Lawler taps, and Taz wins, and you get that great kind of early pop kickoff moment on the show. I thought it was a perfect start to the matches because, again, not every match needs to go a long time. And if you don't need to go there, why go there? This match was everything that it should have been, and the design of it and how it was executed was brilliant, in my opinion. Kurt Angle versus Randy Orton was kind of weird in that Kurt Angle is fighting for and with ECW, even though he never actually worked for ECW. But again, it is what it is. I understand you were trying to put some name recognition on this one night stand. 06 show, so Kurt Angle, Randy Orton having a match here works. Young Randy Orton, too, he was such a prick. And you could tell that unlike Cena, he thrived on the environment he was in. He enjoyed the environment. In this particular case, he wasn't going AWOL, I'll put it that way. It was an adequate match, not anything really special to write home about. But again, you have Kurt Angle go over here, and the crowd really popped. The crowd was really hot. And in general, the crowd was really hot for this show, just like they were in 2005. It was a pretty good start. FBI versus Tajiri and Super Crazy. This is an example of having decent to cool characters in a match that was mediocre at best, but that's okay. And that's really what this was. A match full of decent to cool characters uh, that just had an okay match, but it worked for the crowd. Even though it was kind of strange to see Big Show, who was a part of ECW, come out and wipe out these ECW people after the match. But again, I guess that is whatever. Um, but it served as a good bridge from Kurt Angle and Orton to the World Heavyweight Championship match between Sabu and Rey Mysterio. And I always say this about Sabu. You either get good sab- Sabu or you get botchy, fucked up Sabu. And it felt like in this match you mostly got good, clean action Sabu good clean Sabu or as clean as he was going to be and I will say this is that as much as you like to have decisive finishes and matches if you don't need to then why go there and in this particular case if you didn't need to have Mysterio pin Sabu you didn't need to have Sabu pin Mysterio because you most certainly weren't going to make Sabu the world heavyweight champion why not do something as a finish where both guys look cool doing it and nobody has to job nobody's hurt it actually helps both of them I thought, again, similar to Taz and Jerry Lawler, having the finger on the pulse of what the fans would pop to the most and executing on it was genius. And then in this World Heavyweight Championship match, having Sabu and Rey Mysterio have the type of match that they have and had it end the way that they had, I thought, again, was genius in terms of understanding the audience that you're playing to and giving them what they would want to see. They'd rather see this than a Sabu lose. If you don't have to have Sabu lose in this case, then don't. And I appreciate that the WWE didn't. Uh, But honestly, in this case, this match is kind of forgettable because what came next? Foley, Edge, and Lita versus Funk, Tommy Dreamer, and Beulah McGillicuddy. This match was fucking amazing. It's funny because Funk and Foley really truly are hardcore legends and nobody can ever take that away from them. And it is appropriate that on each side you had Edge and Tommy Dreamer who always kind of thought of themselves as hardcore, always wanted to be hardcore, and did a lot of hardcore shit, but I don't think ever truly get the respect that they deserve for being as hardcore and tough as they were. They don't. Like, you don't think of Edge. You you probably think of Tommy Dreamer more for being a hardcore guy because of uh, House of Hardcore and then all of his time over the years in ECW, the kendo stick and everything else. But you don't really think of Edge as hardcore even though it would be fair to definitely do so with some of the crazy shit he did to his body over the years to entertain the fans. But these two guys who did so much with their bodies over the years would just never be in the classification of a Funk or a Foley, and that's how it is. And and it's funny, this match was just so crazy, and all the barbed wire and all this other shit, that even in a match where you had several matches that were extreme roles, this match still stood out and was still different because of just what limits they went to. The whole premise of it, I thought it was great. And this match was so damn awesome to me that I won't even bitch about the this is awesome chance because to me, for the crowd where you were and the type of match that it was, 
the this is awesome chants I felt were well placed and appropriate. You know it has to be something if I'm not going to bitch about that. And what I always thought was cool was how Edge at this time was still incredibly hated for the leader crap with Matt Hardy and everything else. Edge embraced the hate. He owned the hate and he wanted to be hated. He didn't want to be cool. He wanted to be hated. And you could tell that here. And the finish was just so unnecessary and so ridiculous and so perfect. He's going to sit there and choose to pin Beulah out of every freaking buddy. Out of every freaking buddy. And then spread her legs and fucking dry hump her as the fucking ref counts to three. Just perfect for Edge at this time. Just everything about this match worked. Even when Funk goes back because his eyes yoked up and then he comes back and it's wrapped and he's coming out with the barbed wire uh, two by four whatever the hell and then he sets it on fire the way they use the barbed wire Foley and Funk being stuck in the barbed wire Funk being like I need wire cutters after the match and they got to cut him out of the barbed wire this match was savage this was sick this was hardcore done right unbelievable match clearly the match of this particular show from a tier, pure entertainment value standpoint and a match that probably gets forgetting, forgotten about a lot about how good it was. It really was good. It was a hell of a lot of fun. So it's a tough act to foul that type of match after seeing all of that shit. Another good choice here. Put out Balls Mahoney and Masato Tanaka. That sounds strange to say, but it really isn't. And you, you forget, even though now he's passed away, you forget at the time just how over Balls Mahoney was with the ECW crowd. And you also forget too a little bit, I think, that Balls could work a little bit in terms of a traditional wrestling match. He usually wouldn't, but you could see it a little bit here with Tanaka. He gave Tanaka a little bit in terms of actually working in the ring, actually just a little bit. And it's interesting too with Tanaka. I always thought, you know, while him and Mike Awesome made the best music, uh, Tanaka was still always kind of an odd fit for ECW. But I think with all of the shit that was going on and the types of characters that you had and all the crap that they did and all the hardcore stuff, Tanaka was perfectly suited for ECW. He always was. He was an odd fit and he was absolutely a perfect fit because he was counterculture to so many things that that brand was about back at that time. And it was cool to be able to see Tanaka back for both one night stand shows in 05 in 06. Again, another cool thing that the WWE did. And now you're getting to this point where you got all this out of the way. And you're getting ready to have the, the real money match of the show, let's face it. The one that everybody was tuning in to see that bought this pay-per-view. It was RVD versus John Cena in the Hammerstein Ballroom at ECW One Night Stand for the WWE Championship. This was the match that everybody was cooking for. Then for some reason before, as we're starting to hype it up, we cut out the hype to, to, to really lead into this match by having Eugene come out. Now the premise was okay. Having him come out and saying he loved ECW and giving the fans another reason to boo, the premise was okay. It probably wasn't needed, and it was really poorly placed on the card. It really was. It probably should have went in between uh, the six-person intergender tag and... Mahoney and Tanaka it just was really strange because you're building up to the main event and then you take several steps back to go into this shit and even Sandman coming out and hating Eugene and beating the shit out of him with the kendo stick and sending him running up the ramp well that's a cool ECW type of moment again I don't have a problem with the premise even though it may not have been needed it's still okay to do it I just thought it was really oddly and poorly placed on the card that was just me but then we get to the main event and it can be easy over the passage of time, just how big of a deal this match was. And still to this day, RVD, if memory serves me correctly, is the only person to call his shot ahead of time and cash in legitimately clean his Money in the Bank opportunity. And I thought it worked so well for him. It was so perfect. And you go back and watch the show even 11 years later. What show, what promotion wouldn't live for this type of buzz and this type of heat for their main event? I mean, that place, all 2,500 people or so, were absolutely riveted. It was electric. It was insane. The environment for this match. 
And you can see even back in 2006, the seeds of Cena hate were well established, even though it should have been known then that hijacking shit wasn't going to change anything. And it all these years later, it still fucking didn't. But man, that opening shit when he's trying to throw the t-shirt into the crowd and people are throwing it back and guys are spitting on it and they're fucking wiping their asses with it and telling them, fuck you, fuck you. Man, just awesome. Just absolutely awesome. And what, what sucks about it is a little bit, you could tell early on that it was getting underneath Cena's skin and he was irritated. And frankly, he was a little bit shook up. I don't care what anybody says. You could see it. You can sense it. It was like he didn't want to be there that night because he probably didn't want to be there in that particular environment. And early on, he wasn't as willing to embrace that kind of heel shtick. You had to know going into this match that you're going to work as the heel. You are the hated one. You are the villain. So you know what you have to do in this particular match. And early on, Cena seemed to fight it. Although, as the match got along, he, he embraced it a little bit more and more. I will say the match wasn't all that great. But it probably didn't need to be. Because it was about RVD. Even if it's three years too late. This is a chance for him to finally get his. This was him to get his rightful moment. This was time for him to get his world championship in WWE. If you don't have to do all the sick crazy shit, then why bother? Sure, they did shit with chairs and they did some other stuff, but... You know, in terms of the standard of extreme, especially based off of what else you saw in this card with the intergender tag match, it wasn't that extreme. And frankly, they probably could have toned it down even a little bit more and it would have been just fine. This was all about Cena's the devil, RVD's the messiah, the savior, and he's going to take that belt and win one for good old ECW. And as much as we can shit on Cena over the years about not always doing business right and being selfish and burying a lot of guys and not putting them over at the right time in the right places and all of that is true even though it involved edge getting involved and even you had this and you had that even with Heyman running out and making the count i will say it's an ecw show that was all the way in ecw type of ending i give cena credit for understanding his spot even in 2006 he had enough creative control to be able to sit there and say i'm not going to drop it here but he did he did drop it here. And it really made this event, it made this show, it made this match, it made that night. It really did. And seeing RVD win the belt in front of that crowd was a really cool, awesome, organic fucking moment. Even if by this point in time I had really started to sour on RVD, the fact is, is it was still a cool wrestling moment. And we get too far few in between of these in today's wrestling business. But when you look back on this show, whereas I thought 2005 was a little too WWE versus ECW focused, while you still had some of those elements there, I thought the structure of the show was very good. Several of the booking decisions were spot on. Uh, honestly, the biggest complaint I had about the night was right before the main event, as you're trying to hype up your real money match for the night, you go in a totally different direction with Eugene coming out. And it was just strange and odd. I know a lot of people like 05 better and that's fine. But for my money, if I had to recommend watching one of the two, I would recommend you watch ECW One Night Stand 2006 instead. If for no other reason to see that main event between RVD and John Cena. So that's it. You can tell me your thoughts about this show if you remember watching it back in the day or if you just went back and watched it. In the comments section below, I am the Schleg Daddy. This has been another edition of the Retro Wrestling Review Series here on OTRS Central where it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And remember, oftentimes, I watch this shit so you don't have to. <laughs>